and welcome to another professional development training. This time we'll talk about lesson plans, how to build these and have a much more effective experience in the classroom. Tonight we'll talk about where lesson plans fit into the grand scheme of things in terms of uh, curriculum. We'll look at why they might be useful for you as an instructor, how to actually build these, including both personalization and annotation of an existing lesson plan how to embed activities like labs or group activities within your classroom. And finally, we'll take a real brief look at how we can create online lesson plans, similar but a little bit different than the on-ground plans we'll be talking about today. We've been looking at curriculum over the past few weeks of professional development, the overall sort of big C curriculum, looking at programmatic outcomes, breaking those down into individual courses, creating outcomes for those courses, and then within those courses, creating lessons. Finally, we get down to where the rubber meets the road, the actual instruction, where you, the instructor, are directly interfacing with the student, and you're trying to create a plan of how that's going to work so that you can actually achieve the learning outcomes for that lesson. The assumption being if we've done this right, if we achieve the learning outcomes for that lesson, then we'll be able to get the learning outcomes at the course level met, and if we get the course learning outcomes met, then we'll in fact meet the programmatic outcomes that our students will have received, the learning that needed to occur in order for them to achieve the outcomes necessary for our programs. Now, many of you will look at what we're going to talk about today, and in the back of your mind, you'll be thinking, this is just extra work. I don't need this. I've been teaching forever. This is all just foolishness. You're wasting my time. Not true. Especially when you look at Coleman itself, where we have many classes that are repeating constantly. You may end up teaching the same class three times a day, morning, noon, and night. It's very easy to start to drop sync and forget, did I tell this group this piece of information or did I not? Did I mention the homework that's coming up or did I not? Have I told this story already? I don't remember. It all begins to just flow together and suddenly it's a case of, it's Tuesday, I must be in Pittsburgh. If you break down the learning into lesson plans and you put on the lesson plans the things I'm going to recommend that you do, it'll keep you from getting confused. Not only will this keep you from looking foolish in front of your students, it has a hidden benefit in that it's going to make it much easier for you to take the day off if you're sick or ill or have to go to the doctor, whatever it may be. The way it sits today, if you get sick, no one's really sure where your class was when you left. Yes, we have a syllabus. The syllabus tells us where you're supposed to be in a given week, but where the class actually is is another question entirely. Too often we tend to use labs as a fill-in for, well, we're not sure where the instructor is. Have him do a lab. He'll be back tomorrow. And that's not really appropriate. Instead, we have to focus on if you're following the lesson plan, if you've created lesson plans for all your lessons, then I can take an instructor that knows the basics of that particular field, whatever it is you're talking about, and I can put him or her into your classroom, and they simply look at the lesson plan and say, oh, okay, Bob was covering this, this, and this. And now we have to cover these following four items. And if we follow the four items, he'll be caught up by the time he comes back, and the students will not have fallen back at all. So although it is a little bit more work for you initially, in these iterative classes that we have at Coleman, it actually will very quickly pay for itself in terms of the work, not only in freeing you up some in terms of trying to remember what was or wasn't said, but also freeing you up to be sick without affecting your students. Now, in order to create lesson plans, it helps to have a form. You can have whatever form you want. This is a fairly standard form that uh, is used in most technical training. You've got two different columns, left and right. The left side covers the outline of what needs to be given in that particular lesson. The right side we'll talk about in a minute, which is the annotation and personalization. On the left side, you're outlining what needs to be accomplished. So that means you're not simply outlining the textbook for that week. Instead, you're taking the textbook as it's supposed to be, an ancillary to your teaching, and you're using material from the textbook. You're bringing in material that from a lab, perhaps, or from websites, wherever it is you got the information, so that you have a very logical progression of thought about how to approach this lesson. These lesson plans, like everything else we've talked about in curricula, has to focus on the learning outcomes. It's about giving the students the information and skills they need. In the left side, 
we will talk about labs and assessment activities, but your directions for those will actually appear on the right side, and we'll cover that in a minute. So let's take a little deeper look at the left side of the lesson plans. When you're outlining the lesson, how deep you go, in other words, how dense each of these line items are, depends on you and your readiness as an instructor to teach. If you're brand new at this particular class, you're probably going to have a lot more data on the left side than you would if you've taught the same class for the last five years. If you're creating lesson plans, say, as part of a curriculum development activity, you want to aim for one about midway between I know everything and I know nothing as an instructor. In other words, the depth would be medium. You're going to explain some of the major concepts, not like you would to a student, but as you would to a fellow instructor who maybe has never taught that particular concept before. So the depth can vary. It, there is no right or wrong depth unless it's not working for you in front of the classroom. When we talked about a logical progression of ideas earlier, it's a critical aspect of success as a teacher. If your lesson plan makes sense, if you build your lessons in a very logical manner, it is far easier for your students to remember and understand the concepts because they will be placed in the student's mind in that same logical progression. So the nice thing about doing these lesson outlines is it allows you to tweak these progressions to try to figure out what is the best way to get this through to the student. What is the best way for me to approach this particular difficult concept? Remember that all the content you're listing in the left side of the lesson plan has to be relevant to those learning outcomes. Just because you can find a great website that has all sorts of really cool information on it doesn't mean that you're going to place it in your lesson. It has to be related to those learning outcomes or you're wasting the student's time and your own. If you are bringing in material from outside the textbook, because this can be used by others should you be sick, you also want to include the URL or the reference if it's a book as to where you got that information. You don't want to set up another instructor who's trying to fill your shoes while you're sick to say, oh, well, here's X, Y, and Z, and that's what's really important, and have a student say, well, where's that information? That's not in our textbook. Um, I don't know, it's just here. It makes the instructor look foolish and it makes us look bad as an institution. So please make sure if you're bringing in outside material, and we strongly encourage you to do that, just make sure you reference the material so the instructor who follows you is able to actually pick it up and run with it. Now one last time, I want to emphasize, your instruction is more than reading a textbook to the student. You know that and I know that. So when you're outlining this lesson plan, do not fall into the trap of simply outlining the textbook and using the table of contents as the primary means of creating one of those. You're not helping yourself and you're not helping your students when you do it. As always, it's all about the outcomes. So if the basic information is on the left, what do we put on the right side? Well, this is the annotation or personalization of the lesson. When we annotate, we are adding more information to the lesson. So perhaps in the lesson itself, on the left side, there's a concept that's kind of hard for students to get their head around. But I have a great story that explains it and suddenly makes it crystal clear to the students. Then I'm going to go through and annotate on the right-hand side and say, don't forget to tell this story and emphasize these points of the lesson. It's also critical to have annotations that are warnings or cautions. If a student could potentially be hurt by what you're doing in the classroom or the lab, you need to make sure that not only you tell the student that by writing the notes in here, but whoever follows you on a sick day also has the opportunity to protect the students from any kind of danger. These are not optional. We always have to make sure any kind of warning or caution, any kind of risk, is noted on the right-hand side. You can also write down questions that you want to ask the class to make sure the learning has been reinforced as soon as they get it. Anything that you want to write in here is up to you, as long as it's relevant to whatever is on the left. Some of this information is going to be part of the lesson. In other words, the warnings, the cautions, the things that are true no matter who's teaching the lesson. You can type those in if you want to. In this particular example, you see that we're getting at a very remedial level, or actually telling the instructor when to show slides and when to take slides off of a PowerPoint presentation. You don't have to go into this depth, but it's there if you wish. Once you've actually got it to this point, it is a good lesson plan. In other words, I could give it to almost any instructor who knew what they were doing, and they could pick it up and just in a few minutes be able to start effectively teaching the lesson. But we can go one step further, and that is 
on the right-hand side, after we've annotated the important information, we personalize it. And this is where you make the instruction yours. Prior to this point, when we simply outlined the lesson on the left and when we annotated it on the right, it was sort of generic, here's the lesson. There was nothing that said, this is Bob or John or Mary teaching the lesson. It was the lesson. Well, now you make the class yours, and you write down your stories. You write down your jokes. There's nothing worse than telling the same joke to the same class four times because you forgot the first three times that you told it to them. So if you write it down in your lesson plans, you're never going to be in that embarrassing situation. If you're anything like me, you do tend to have these Alzheimer's indicators that maybe you're not really as smart as you think you are. Write down the notes. Write down any kind of aids that you need. If you're trying to bring these materials to life in your class, you want to make sure you have all the information you need on these notes. Now realize, when I talk about lesson plans and notes, it's not that you're going to be standing in front of the class reading the lesson plans to them. These are, in a sense, your refresher. You've taught the class before, or you've approached it and you're preparing yourself the first time. It gives you a chance to get the information you need for the next one hour, two hours, four hours, whatever it may be, actively in your head in a logical manner. Once it's there, you can start teaching your class. You can use your PowerPoints for uh, reminders if need be. But the lesson plan is there, so if you do get stuck, you can go back and look and go, oh, that's right, I've got to cover this and this and this. It's a very helpful way of giving yourself a crutch whether or not you actually need one at that particular point in time. Now, some of the other things that we can add in as personalizations that really make our lives easier. Put down notes uh, at the end of one lesson before the next day's lesson. Don't forget to make copies for tomorrow. Remind the students there's a quiz that's due next week. Remind the students to study Chapter 6 because there's going to be an in-class examination on it. Whatever it may be, once we write these up or write our note to ourselves, remember to switch out the hard drives for the lab next week. We look much more professional. The students don't see the notes, but the students see the actions, and they suddenly come into classrooms that are ready. They come into labs that are ready to go for them so they can actually start learning something instead of waiting around for an hour while we try to figure out what's required and what's necessary. If you have really cool websites that illustrate a point, but not well enough that you need to show them in class, sort of extra activity if students ask, go ahead and mark those down. You look very smart when you walk up and say, oh, by the way, if you're interested in, uh, you know, binary math, here's a great site for it. If you're looking more on statistics, here's a great site for it. If you get confused what an independent clause is, here's a great site for how to figure out what the rules of grammar are in English. Those are wonderful additions to your teaching. And again, it's adding value to the students, which is something we always enjoy seeing. My final point for annotation personalization, I know we've kind of spent a while on this, is highlighters are your friend. Again, these are your teaching notes, they're for review, but at the same time, you may have to glance down at them while teaching. If you put up a set of highlighters with each color having a specific meaning, so that yellow may be important ideas I've got to cover in class, reds are warnings, greens are jokes, whatever it may be, you can highlight your particular copy of the lesson plan so that when you're standing in the classroom, you can look down and go, oh, that's right, there's that major point I've got to make. Let me make that point. Again, it speeds up the process of teaching. You're not looking for a piece of information. You're not trying to remember a piece of information. It's right there in front of you, readily available should you need it. When I talked about embedding activities earlier, what I'm looking at is not a complete replacement of lab manuals. I mean, we'd like to in the long run, but we can at least refer to the key points that I want to give as an instructor in the lab. So I don't have to have an instructor's lab manual and a student's lab manual. Instead, maybe I can have a lesson plan that contains all the important parts of the instructor's lab manual, and then a student manual that is available online, say, through a Moodle, that has, say, the steps they've got to go through, or has the formulas they have to refer to, whatever it may be. The idea is we save trees, we save time, we save money. As mentioned earlier, one of the important things for a lab is making sure everything is set up. If you embed that inside your lesson plan, you're far less likely to forget something. You see here a number of other possibilities. We've covered most of them. The bottom line here is, if I clarify my activities, be it an in-class activity, a group activity, a lab, whatever it may be, it is far more likely that students will learn. There is nothing worse for an instructor or for a student 
than to have a clumsily handled lab where things don't work the way they're supposed to work. No one seems to know what's happening. The instructor seems to be lost and the students just sitting there saying, I'm paying what? Why am I doing this? If we can set up our activities so they flow smoothly from the lessons so that they look professional, we will have far greater attention to the information and greater satisfaction by our students. Okay, that's all on ground. If that's on ground, What's the difference between on-ground and online? Well, obviously, we don't have lectures online. We have a lot of written material online, but that's a whole different issue and a different way of dealing with uh, lesson plans. However, you may have some interaction with students. If you decide to have a synchronous chat, it's critical to have a lesson plan for that. What am I trying to accomplish in this time together? What are my major learnings that I have to give to the students? What are the uh, outcomes that must be achieved in this short time together? Students appreciate being able to talk with you and each other online, but they really don't want to waste their time. Synchronous chat is the ability for the instructor to interact with the student in a similar way to the way they interact in a classroom, where a student can ask a question and the instructor can in real time try to answer that question for the whole class. So it does take a little more effort to make these things work. Now we don't do a lot of synchronous chats here, but even for the asynchronous activities that are class-wide or group activities. Um, Creating announcements to make sure that your class understands what's coming up can be embedded in the lesson plan to make sure you know to tell them ahead of time, hey, don't forget, the midterm is next week. You need to have it completed by Wednesday. Please make sure you start it. The test will start on Monday, whatever it may be. You can also use lesson plans to give you a better sense of feedback on any kind of uh, assignment or project that they have. If the assignment has a detailed rubric, you can still go back and say, all right, well, how do I explain the rubric to the students and write this stuff down ahead of time so you don't forget it in the course of actually creating this online activity. And forum comments. If you're building a forum where you want the students to interact with each other and you want them to arc and spark on the various questions you're throwing at them, if nothing else, write down the questions. Write down some of the suggested answers. If you come up with a really cute way of twisting them around so they move the direction of the conversation in the way you want it to go, write that down. So you have to remember it 10, 12, 14 weeks from now. But instead, be able to say, aha. In week four, discussion five, I need to remember to do this. And if I do this, it'll all work out. The more we take notes, the easier it is for us to improve our education. Whether we're talking about doing things on ground or online, the principle's the same. If we write and learn from our own experience, we get better at teaching. I appreciate the time you spent with me so far, but I know some of you still may not be convinced and you think I'm taking you down some little garden path that's going to waste your time and provide all sorts of free material for the university. That's not what this is about. This is about saving you time and effort. Remember, I'm a lazy person. I look for the easiest way to do things with the most amount of impact so I don't have to redo the work and I don't have to work hard. Everybody prep. Well, strike that. Professional instructors prepare for a lesson, no matter how many times they've taught it. Now, I'm assuming all of you are professional instructors. I assume all of you do try to get ready for your class before it actually occurs. So you're doing this work anyway. You're still going through the textbook with a, nothing else thumbing through it. You're still thinking, okay, I've got four hours to fill. What am I going to do? You're just not doing it very systematically. You're doing it in a haphazard way from class to class to class. You're not gaining any benefit from this iterative reteaching of courses that we do here at Coleman. If you take the time in that first class, or if you take the time in the next time you teach the class you're currently teaching, to write down these notes as you're going through them, then instead of digging through the whole textbook, instead of rooting around trying to find that one really cool website, it's all there in one place, and it's ready to go. So suddenly, if it took an hour to prep for your class this mod, maybe it's going to be down to a half hour the mod after that, and maybe down to 15 minutes the mod after that, and yet you will be more effective in the classroom because the information is there in front of you, you've had the time to make it yours, and more importantly, you're letting the students learn, and that's what's critical. You get better by paying attention to what you do and not doing the wrong things again than making sure you do the right things over and over. Okay. All right. I know I'm kind of on my soapbox, but these are important concepts. Think about it.
At least try it for one lesson to see if it does you any good whatsoever. They are going to help you improve your teaching. If nothing else, at least outline the material and put in the key annotations, the warnings, the hazards, the cautions, the labs, whatever it may be, just so you have something in front of you. You never know when you're going to be sick, and every year we're amazed we don't have enough instructors to cover everybody's classes. If we had these lesson plans, those kind of emergencies would not turn into crises. I appreciate the time and effort. I hope you found this helpful, and we'll stay by for even more professional development courses in the future. Thank you much, and hey, have a great day.